All right, guys, um, this week we're going to do a couple of labs, and the first one we're going to do is a separation of a mixture. And the name of that technique, that, that broad category of techniques in chemistry is chromatography. So um, the key thing that you guys understand here is that because it's a mixture, that means each of the components are not chemically bonded to each other. So we're not separating any chemical bonds. There's no chemical changes going on here. All we're doing is separating some of the, the particles from other particles physically. So this is going to be a physical change that's going to take stuff that's already in there and just separate them from each other. So we're not creating any new substances. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the theory a little bit, and then I'll walk you through the lab, and we'll get started. Okay, so here I have a mixture of a bunch of different particles. They're not chemically bonded to each other, so I can separate them without a chemical change. And I want to separate them using chromatography. So all chromatographies, there's gas chromatography, thin layer chromatography, liquid chromatography, paper chromatography, they all work on the same basic principle, which is we're going to have some stationary phase, which in this case is going to be our table here. Okay, So the table it does not move throughout the experiment. And then we're going to pull our sample through the stationary phase using some mobile phase. So mobile means it's, it can move around, stationary means it stays put. Things that have a strong attraction for the mobile phase will get pulled very quickly through the stationary phase. So they're going to they're gonna move real fast up our paper in our lab here. Things that have a stronger attraction for the stationary phase will not get pulled as quickly. So what's going to end up happening is we'll start seeing a separation like this. So if we let the chromatography run a little bit, what's happened is the analyte, which is our mixture here, has started to move up the stationary phase because it's being pulled along with the mobile phase. And some of the different colored blocks are moving a little bit slower, like these yellow ones here. So these yellow blocks must have a stronger affinity for the table. They're, they have a strong affinity for the stationary phase, so they can't move that fast. These guys up here at the front have a really strong affinity for the mobile phase, and so they're getting pushed really fast up the table. So we're going to let the chromatography keep going a little bit here. Now we can see as the chromatography has continued, the yellow stuff has hardly moved at all. It's still down here at the bottom because it's really strongly bonded to that stationary phase. But that blue stuff is moving right along with the mobile phase, and it's made it all the way up here to the top. Each one of these different substances is moving at a slightly different speed through the chromatography. And because of that, they start to separate themselves out. So it might look like, by the way, We've created a blue substance up here, but we haven't created a blue substance. It was already blue. All we did was separate that blue stuff from the jumble of all the other colors. So make sure you remember chromatography is not a chemical change. It's just a physical change. All we're doing is separating out things based on their affinities to the mobile phase and stationary phase. Okay, guys, this is just a brief overview of the lab procedure. You still have to read the procedure and follow it as you go, but I just want to show you what you should expect in the lab. So this is my piece of chromatography paper. It's not the same thing as regular copy paper. Um, it's a lot more expensive because the, the pore size, little tiny holes in the paper, are very consistent in this type of paper. And that's really important for experimentation so that you have nice repeatability. So every time you buy this paper, it's got the same size holes, same size pores in it. So I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit of a crease in the middle of it just so it stays straight and doesn't bend and touch the sides of our container. Okay, so I'm not really folding it all the way, I'm just giving it a little crease so that it stays straight. Okay, so then I need to put a pencil line a couple of centimeters up from the bottom of the paper. And that's important because I want to know where my chromatography started. In other words, what was the starting line for my sample, right? So I got the pencil line right across the paper like so. And now I'm ready to load my sample. 
So in this paper chromatography, to load the sample, it's real simple. All you're going to do is take your marker. In this case, I'm using this one first. And you're just going to draw a thin line right on top of the pencil line, straight across. Okay, so there we go. The thinner your line is, the better your separation is going to look in the chromatography. So it's going to spread out a little bit because the marker is going to soak into the paper, but that's pretty good. And then we need to prepare our chamber, which is going to be a test tube here. So the key thing here is that we don't want the mobile phase to be above the level of the station of the uh, analyte when we start the experiment. So when we put the water in, we got to make sure it's below the, the marker line. So we can only put about that much water into this test tube. So let me go ahead and add my mobile phase. In this case is water. Okay, it doesn't need very much because the water is going to move up the paper by capillary action. So we don't have to put a whole bunch of water in there. I just want to double check and make sure, yeah, that's not too much water because the water level is not up to where the marker is. And then I can go ahead and very carefully drop my paper down into my chamber here. And you can see that the water is going to start moving up the paper. Okay. Now, in order to keep the water vapor the same, the, the concentration of water vapor the same throughout this test tube, we need to put a cap on it. And to do that, we're going to use something called parafilm. Okay. So parafilm is cool stuff. We're going to use it quite a bit this year. And um, what it basically is is a piece of wax, paraffin wax. So to use parafilm, all you do is you take this piece of stuff here, parafilm, okay? And there's a papery side and there's a waxy side. You want to have the papery side up so the waxy side is going to touch your test tube. And then you're just going to grab the two corners, put it over the test tube, and pull straight down until the paper breaks. And it'll kind of stretch to cover the test tube, and now you've got an airtight and watertight seal on top of the test tube there, okay? And you can see that my, uh, my mixture here is already starting to separate. It's real important you don't move the stuff around too much while it's separating, because that'll be a variable that's kind of added in. And over here, you can see we've got one that's been going for a little bit longer, and the separation's really started to take off. The key thing here, guys, remember is this is not a chemical change because those colors were already in there. We didn't make new colors, okay? We're just separating out the colors that were present in the marker. Let's uh, go ahead and fast forward and see what it looks like when it's all finished. Now, it's really important when, as the chromatography is running, you guys keep an eye on your separation. And you really shouldn't pick up the test tube and move it around. I'm just going to do that so you can see a little bit closer. But um, you want to make sure that your solvent front or your mobile phase, it's moving up the paper you have to stop the chromatography before that mobile phase reaches the very top of the paper. Okay, you need to pull it out of the chamber and mark the position of that mobile phase before it reaches the top. So just make sure you're keeping an eye on all of your, your trials as they're running and don't forget about them. Okay guys, so my solvent front has reached near the top of the paper and as soon as it gets about this far from the top of the paper, you want to take it out of the test tube. And you can use the tweezers that I gave everyone to do that. Okay, so you just pull it out of the, of the chromatography chamber. And before the solvent can dry, this is super important, you want to take your pencil again and mark where the solvent was when you pulled it out of the, of the test tube. Okay, because the water is going to start evaporating as soon as we take it out of there. And you're not going to know where it was unless you mark it, okay? So you want to look for where the water level is, not where the top color is. In this case, it happens to be the same thing, but look for where the water mark was at the top of the paper and mark it as soon as you take it out. Okay, so now, because chemistry is a quantitative science, we want to get some quantitative measurements off of this lab. So to do that, you need to take your ruler, and of course, we always use the centimeter marks, not the inch marks, we don't care about the imperial system. And we're going to place the ruler right on the starting mark, the starting pencil mark on our piece of chromatography paper. And we want to measure the distance from the starting line to where the solvent front stopped. In other words, where the watermark was at the top of the piece of paper. Okay, you want to measure that distance and write it down. Okay, so this total distance from the starting mark all the way to the top mark is going to be used in all of our calculations here for the R value. Now what you want to do is measure the distance between the starting mark and approximately the middle of each color band. Okay, now I know these colors are kind of spread out, okay, so that's kind of bad in chromatography. You'd rather have nice sharp bands, but that's okay here. So you're going to measure from wherever the starting line is 
to wherever you think the middle of the color band is. So let's say for this pink band right here, I think the middle of it is somewhere around here, okay? So I'm gonna measure that distance from the starting mark to the middle of that pink band and write it down, okay? Then I'm gonna do the same thing for every other color. So from the starting mark to the middle of this orange, from the starting mark to the middle of this kind of dark red color up here, starting mark to the middle of this blue color, starting mark to the middle of this yellow color. So for this particular marker, I'm gonna have a measurement for distance for every single color that I can see. So yellow, orange, pink, red, and blue, right? So I have distance from start to where the solvent stopped, that total distance written down, and then I'm gonna have a distance for every color from the starting mark to the middle of the yellow, starting mark to the middle of the orange, starting mark to the middle of the pink, starting mark to the middle of the red, starting mark to the middle of the blue. Now what are we gonna do with all these measurements? I'll show you in one second. So we have the measurements from the, from the chromatography, and now we're gonna calculate something called an R value. So you might see it R sub F like this, R value. So the R value formula is, it's the distance that the solvent traveled on bottom. So that's gonna be the distance from our starting mark here all the way up to the finishing line up here where the solvent stopped. That goes on bottom. And on top, you're gonna put the distance that each substance traveled. So you're gonna calculate an R value for each individual color, okay? So let's say, for example, in this lab that the distance that my solvent traveled from here to here was 8.3 centimeters, okay? So that's my distance that I'm gonna put on the bottom of every single R value calculation, so 8.3 centimeters. Now, I wanna calculate the R value first of let's say the pink substance, right? So for the pink stuff, I'm gonna take the distance from the starting mark to the middle-ish of the pink stuff here, and let's say that was like 2.1 centimeters. I'm just making up numbers, but you'll measure these from the lab. So that number is gonna go on top of this R value calculation. So you divide 2.1 divided by 8.3, and you're gonna get for this one 0. Point, and we have two sig figs here, right? two, five, and the units are actually nothing because the centimeters cancel each other and you get no units. So R value is a ratio, it doesn't have any units. Now you're gonna calculate an R value for every individual color using this formula. It's the distance that the substance traveled divided by the entire distance that the solvent traveled. So for each strip of paper, you should have a whole table of R values, one for every individual color. So at the end of this whole thing, you're gonna end up with a table that looks something like this. You'll have, for each marker, a list of all the substances and their calculated R values. Now what's the point of all this? Well, the different R values tell us something about the affinity that each one of these substances has for the mobile phase versus the stationary phase. Things that have a really high R value moved really far up the paper really fast. And so that means that they have some strong affinity for the mobile phase. They liked sticking with the mobile phase and getting pulled up the paper. The stuff that has a really low R value had a stronger affinity for the stationary phase. So it liked to stay put, like to get stay behind and interact with the paper in this case. So these numbers are also really useful because if we ever do this experiment again and we get the exact same R value for two substances, they may be the same substance. So this is something we use a lot in, in chemistry to identify stuff. We see how, how it moves through a chromatography, calculate its R value, and compare that to a list of known R values, and, and that gives us some idea of what the stuff is. So R values are really useful. They, they are an intensive property of the substance. They help us identify it. We'll learn more about that later on. And um, that's why we're calculating these things here. So you guys are gonna do the lab tomorrow. Hopefully everything works the way it does here. It's a fun lab, it's cool. And make sure you are still reading the procedure as you do the lab, not just looking back at the video, all right.